Right. Well, good afternoon, <laughs> all of you. Uh, and I am Polly Palmer, and uh, I teach uh, CNCS on products and industrial design, interior architecture and design, and model design and special effects. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in how students learn actually outside the lecture room, um, doing things beyond the lecture room. So um, th this is what my talk is going to be about. Uh, can you move us on, please, Grace? Yes, sure. Yes, so uh, uh, I call myself a jack of all trades, and Grace has told me off about that. Um, and uh, I know that there's a euphemism for that, which is a generalist. Um, and uh, that's what I am, really. I, I'm, uh, I trained as a, actually trained as a, a, a product and industrial designer, a furniture designer, in fact, to be, be specific. And uh, I've only got into this bit of business right, quite late on in life. And I've done lots of educational jobs with all kinds of audiences. Um, everybody except primary, I think. I've done further education, uh, secondary and now higher. Um, and uh, I have always um, used hands-on activities uh, to expand on what I'm doing to give uh, students experiential insight, if you like. Um, and I particularly did this a lot when I was in secondary school, uh, teaching design technology, and uh, subsequently when I went to the Design Museum and I was the education manager at the Design Museum. And we did a lot of that stuff. We had a lot of products and uh, we used to um, do a lot of things with the products um, with the students. And uh, when I came to start teaching interior architecture, uh, it seemed to me that I couldn't really use objects anymore, other than furniture, which I did a bit. Um, and uh, I needed to start looking at sites and uh, um, spaces. Uh, and um, so inside and out. So uh, that made me expand what I did. And also, uh, I was very keen to take the students, all of the students, um, to museums um, and other sites where they might learn. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the educational benefits, really, of, uh, of that, those kinds of visits. Um, particularly to engage the interest of the students. Um, so, next slide, please. Now, it has struck me that uh, uh, there's been quite a, a lot of change, cultural, uh, social and cultural change, um, in the last, uh, certainly in the last 20 years, and in the, you know, um, unbelievably, uh, um, exponential change in the last 10 years and uh, our students um, are, are really quite different to those formerly. Um, there's also been uh, uh, increased access to higher education and so we get a different kind of demographic, um, a, a very wide range of students uh, from all different classes in society really, all different levels of society and uh, consequently, they have very different experiences before they come here. Um, I also get, uh, in, I have to say all the cohorts that I teach also are really different, really different. And that's a challenge in itself because I can't just say, oh, well, UH students are like this. UH creative arts students are like this. They're all really different. And the three that I teach this year are unimaginably different, really. So um, obviously there are certain uh, common, there's certain common ground, but uh, sometimes it's hard to pin down. Um, as I also have lots of international students. In some groups, a majority of international students. So you have people who are working in their second language who have a completely different cultural experience. And that, of course, is a huge benefit in some ways. It's great. Um, to have that input, but uh, on the other hand, um, it, it makes it very difficult to find common ground sometimes. Uh, and a, a lot of students, therefore, have not seen much 
culturally. They don't have a lot of basic cultural knowledge, either because of their general background uh, or, or because um, they, they don't have a knowledge of essentially European culture, which is essentially what I teach. I do my best to expand to world culture, but uh, you know, I, basically you have to, have to work on what you're best at, don't you? Um, now, also, uh, culture is being redefined all over the place uh, because we live in the digital age and uh, it, it's, uh, everything is changing. Um, and uh, <coughs> we shall have a look at that uh, because culture has very definitely broadened or the definition of what culture consists of. Um, and uh, obviously, this has an impact on contextual studies. This has an impact on what we teach and how we teach it. Next slide, please, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to have a look at some of those definitions of culture by various bodies and people. Um, uh, from, uh, you know, what we, what we class as traditional high culture uh, to uh, vernacular culture, everyday experiences of culture. Um, and, uh, you know, what the stu student's um, experience of, of culture is. Um, and how people have uh, explored the youth demographic um, and the student demographic and, and how that has changed or is viewed in a different way. Um, and then having looked at all of that, we'll look at, uh, at visits and how um, visits help to engage the students uh, who are su obviously such a varied group. Um, and then uh, I'll give you my view of how all of that impacts on contextual studies. So my aim, really, uh, as a teacher, is to draw the students into uh, some kind of reflective analysis, to make them think about what they're seeing and what they're handling, what they're experiencing. Um, and and uh, my idea is to, is to give them out-of-study experiences, so take them out of the lecture room um, and, uh, and into the street or the site or the venue uh, and to experience culture in those situations. Thank you. Um, and uh, what, do, what do we actually want our students to know? What do we want them to understand? Um, uh, from my point of view, I want them to uh, be able to engage directly with spaces, with products, um, and with the whole cultural experience, not least the institutions where they find those things. Um, a, a very uh, eclectic mix of cultural experiences, in other words, uh, um, doing something that's, that's relatively um, vernacular, everyday kind of experience, perhaps very close to the, or even in the university, um, through to you know, what we might call high culture uh, in a museum or a gallery. And um, they, I think, as a designer, you need to have a, a fairly pretty rich understanding of culture so that you've got something to draw on. You know, the students have to have a head full of ideas and experiences that they can actually draw on. Otherwise, um, you know, you're, you, you have absolutely nothing to give. So... Types of visits, these are all the sorts of things that I do. Um, uh, so I'm looking at how cultural visits can, visits can, in, in, uh, can advance um, student knowledge and their understanding and skills. Um, so uh, starting with things on the doorstep. What can we experience actually in the campus or uh, very close by? Um, and that might be uh, some kind of visual analysis or it might be a social context. We're very lucky here in the subjects that I teach. Uh, we're very fortunate with social context. You'll see some of it uh, in a minute. Uh, um, and uh, so often that is also linked with a studio project also. Um, 
muse conventional museum gallery visits with some kind of CNCS input, um, uh, where they're going to research something specific for an outcome, which is uh, assessed, possibly. Uh, and uh, that's uh, pretty prescriptive, really. From my point of view, I will tell them what I want them to do in there uh, um, to stop that sort of McDonald's drift that you get with, uh, with visits, you know, where they, they, they make some sort of... Uh, give you some kind of impression of looking at things. Uh, they walk through and they gather speed and then they nip off to McDonald's. I, I don't, you know, I give them something which retains them in there for a couple of hours, <laughs> ideally. Um, and then when, we, when they've got an experience of that, I then uh, ask them to go to places self-directed, uh, to go and um, do some work on a particular aspect of what we're doing, uh, actually on the module. And that can be assessed or not assessed or part of a portfolio kind of assessment. Um, and uh, sometimes we do things that relate to outside agencies, you know, like a live project or um, a, a, a competition. Um, again, I'll detail this. So I've got three case studies uh, looking at uh, cultural participation through visits. Next slide, please, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so this is my kind of uh, structure of, uh, of my study. Uh, so I'm looking at, at uh, very briefly at theory and uh, um, culture, what definitions of culture, what culture is, um, and practice, what, what uh, I'm actually doing, and they are actually doing. And then some kind of synthesis of those to understand where the current cohort of students are um, culturally and how, what they uh, are getting out of um, visits. So the, the first case study would be visiting local and familiar places. Uh, second one, visiting local but perhaps unfamiliar cultural experiences. And the third one, visiting... Uh, something that's both unknown to them and unfamiliar. Uh, in other words, a situation in which they might feel uh, a little uncomfortable. And I'm hoping that that will result in some kind of new uh, um, cultural map of the students. Like. So, education theory, I'm going to skip through this really quite quickly. But this is, this is very much my background, you know, so this is how I'm thinking. And, and one of the things that uh, influenced me um, was Howard Gardner's uh, theory of multiple intelligences. In other words, we all experience things in different ways. We all learn things in different ways. Um, it, it's not that we don't have, it, have these things, uh, that some of them we have and some of them we don't. Gardner suggested that we all have all of these things, but to different degrees and different strengths. Um, so, in other words, you probably need, if you've got a group of people in front of you, a number of approaches to actually, for it to make sense to all of them. That's the shorthand, I think. Uh, I was quite interested that they've recently added naturalist which is the ability, it's very, very focused, the ability to remember botanical names. Uh, and uh, actually, my partner's one of those, so I'm going to have to tell him he's got a special yeah. talent. He can do that. Yes, carry on, Grace. No, time to move on. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, much of our education system, our school education system anyway, has been very much influenced by uh, the idea of the IQ, you know, which is basically linguistic and uh, mathematical, logical learning. Um, and uh, obviously Michael Gove would uh, endorse that. Um, and uh, Gardner obviously does not really agree with that. Um, but he, su he suggests that um, each of those particular kinds of intelligence that he's identified um, they are dependent on ex actually experiencing the particular domain that, that the student's working in. Um, and attention and motivation, uh, particularly, and cognitive style, but attention and motivation are critical. And uh, I think that's interesting because one of the, the characteristics, perhaps, of our latest generation is that uh, perhaps those are particularly, for some of them, strong characteristics. Okay, next. 
Uh, and the other thing uh, that influenced me is uh, Bloom's taxonomy of learning, where uh, you basically start at the bottom with learning um, and, and work through the stages. And this, to me, uh, this, this feels a little bit like um, um, I, what's it, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand, that kind of, uh, that kind of progression. Uh, which I always thought was Lego's motto. I think it was for a while, but it's actually Confucius. <laughs> so there we go. But uh, um, yes, next one, please, Grace. Uh, um, and uh, Bloom uh, sees three different domains of learning, um, knowing, head learning, feeling, heart learning, and doing hands learning. Um, and obviously, we can see that our students are probably doing a, a fair amount of all of those, really. Uh, but some of them will be stronger um, than others at, at uh, each of those. So, it's about, for me, it's about holistic learning. It's about uh, uh, learning in lots of different domains and areas and uh, types of experience and ability. Next. Culture. Lots of people uh, have been busy in the last 10 or 15 years redefining uh, what culture is all about. Um, and uh, Bourdieu, quite a while ago, um, said uh, that culture, a work of art, has meaning and interest only for someone who possesses the cultural competence, that is the code into which, is it, which it is encoded. Um, and uh, um, there's also uh, a sense that uh, funding in Britain uh, for cultural projects um, comes quite a lot from the National Lottery, which is largely funded by the working class um, and uh, who actually have not been uh, very active in uh, culture on the whole, or what the old definition of culture. Um, so uh, Bourdieu... Uh, it's, he divided culture into elite and popular culture. Uh, but these boundaries, like every other kind of boundary, it seems, in our age, uh, has been, that has been blurred. Um, and many, certainly people um, who were formerly uh, taking part, perhaps at the high end of culture, uh, have become omnivores uh, and now actually uh, are, are interested in culture across the board. Um, so, uh, we have things that, uh, uh, you know, the, the poppies at the Tower of London are a case in point, you know, funded by the National Lottery and Heritage Foundation and, all, all, um, and the Arts Council, all of those people, uh, uh, and five million people have been to see it, and that's extraordinary, really. Uh, and so, um, you know, there, there are uh, many examples of... <laughs> Uh, the popularity of what was formerly thought to be high culture um, to a much, much wider audience. You know, the astonishment of the Tate Modern when they were absolutely deluged by people when they opened, um, you know, what was that, nearly 15 years ago now. But, uh, you know, there, there's something going on. There is something going on. And uh, more of us are interested in, in that kind of... Uh, um, uh, cultural world and want to be part of it and feel comfortable with it. Yes, I, I got this from the uh, the secret meaning of things by Stephen Bailey, uh, which is uh, which is all about taste. Um, and this is uh, old classifications from the nineteen seventies of culture, um, and uh, uh, I th I, th I find this quite interesting, really. Um, and for, so low culture. Uh, there's no concern at all with abstract ideas, um, a very kind of crude uh, definitions of, of, uh, of action and, uh, and art. Uh, and it's all about the performer, it's about celebrity culture, um, and uh, very highly ornate um, items are, are valued and of interest. Um, and, and that gradually uh, metamorphoses into high culture where uh, we're, we are interested in, in abstract ideas and the creative process and symbolism and we look for deeper meaning in things. Experiment is, is 
welcome. It doesn't have to be figurative. Uh, we don't have to be able to recognise something literally. Um, introspection, uh, and you know, the, it doesn't have to be all singing, all dancing. Uh, we, you know, we are uh, capable of considering what we're lo what we're looking at, and um, an actual expectation of different levels of meaning. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what uh, what people are saying now is that all of these are merging rather, and people are moving quite readily uh, between uh, these all of these classifications. Um, other ideas about um, culture and uh, research into it. Um, Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired, uh, he came up with a long tail theory. Um, and uh, culture, uh, as well as commerce, he says, is uh, uh, led by niche markets, actually, and not by a general movement at all. Um, and so there are lots and lots of people with, uh, with tastes in uh, particular um, areas uh, and that is driving culture rather than um, a, a, a general acceptance of certain aspects which define culture. Um, and uh, a very interesting uh, uh, study that was done for, for the DCMS uh, by uh, Miles and Sullivan um, uh, came up with the, uh, the conclusion that really what policy ought to be doing is promoting this omnivorousness, this, this new um, sense of, of the blurred uh, boundaries. And that the biggest problem actually is disengagement of a certain uh, category of people. <laughs> um, and uh, that disengagement disappeared when uh, you actually became much more informal um, and mundane and you, and you went to the vernacular aspects of culture. Um, so, also, uh, the Arts Council, the same year, um, they uh, came up with the, with the result from their study um, t that uh, actually... Uh, young people in the most challenging social and economic circumstances are the least likely to participate in the arts. Um, and uh, also, so social stratification is still relevant as more highly educated people are more omnivorous in their taste, while some disadvantaged groups appear to be characterised by non-engagement and dislikes. So, uh, people um, sometimes just simply reject the whole idea of culture. Um, and the, the Arts Council in, uh, in 2005, they looked at various social classes and age groups um, at, who were at uh, visual arts and crafts events. Um, and in, that, uh, in those, uh, those events, the young age group was almost uh, non-existent, really, really very much in a minority. Um, but uh, in certain areas of, uh, uh, of the arts, um, they were very interested. Electronic video and electronics, live music, carnival, cinema. Um, uh, and uh, so it wasn't that they weren't interested in the arts. They were actually uh, interested in different kinds of arts. That's uh, Sorry, my um, formatting has gone a bit strange there. I don't know why that's happened. It wasn't like that before. Um, yes, the, uh, the, the groups that display non-engagement and dislikes... Um, in Miles and Sullivan's uh, analysis, um, uh, were very largely, the, the, or the, not a majority, but quite a sizable minority were from the 16 to 24 age group. And uh, they were characterised by saying, not, it's not for people like me, culture's not for people like me. Um, interview, uh, but Andrew Miles interviewed the negative respondents and uh, when they started talking about what they generally did, uh, they actually had quite a, a strong engagement with sort of fairly mundane everyday activities which have not been classed as culture. So things like uh, hobbies, you know, cooking and uh, um, collecting things and uh, uh, going to see live music, 
uh, of various sorts, um, uh, you know, lots of different, uh, and cinema, you know, people are very interested in film. Um, so, you know, a lot, there's a lot going on there, uh, but people generally feel that if it's called culture or if it's called art or, uh, you know, they, they do not want to engage with it. So the Arts Council has said uh, that uh, we need to balance competing pressures, different views of artistic quality, what's offensive, what's inspiring, different art forms and aesthetics, different audiences, time frames and places, uh, reflecting a vast and extraordinary breadth of activity. Um, and I just put these two images, the images in this, in this are all mine, they're, they're sort of from my life, if you like. Uh, and this is the, uh, the Olympic torch being carried through Stevenage. Um, and uh, a huge turnout on a rainy day, and, and just a fabulous feel-good kind of event. Uh, and uh, th that, I suppose, the Arts Council would class as, uh, you know, this, this uh, sort of uh, vernacular culture. Uh, here you've got a small local um, festival, music festival. Um, uh, those sort of things, I think, are what they are um, uh, thinking about, really, in redefining culture and uh, getting people on the culture ladder, if you like. We talk about companies getting people on the brand ladder um, so that once they're on, they just get drawn upwards, and uh, I guess that's what we're thinking about. Um, the, the Arts Council Taking Part survey um, classified people into sort of characteristics of their uh, cultural participation. And there was one group called the Fun Fashion and Friends group, which had a, a large number, a large proportion of younger people in it. Um, and uh, they, they have, uh, they're, they're very sociable, they like kind of fairly light, what we might call fairly lightweight um, uh, culture, live music, musicals, plays, art exhibitions, uh, shopping and cooking. Um, uh, they like anything that seems to be uh, contemporary and interesting and trendy and, and fun. They're, they're online a lot. Uh, they don't read newspapers. They don't really watch television. Um, and, but there's quite a lot of, of quite rich activity in there, uh, which is not perhaps being addressed by uh, uh, organisations like the Arts Council. Blurred boundaries between the people singled out for niche marketing by the Arts Council, those sort of people, um, and the, and the non-participants who Andrew Miles interviewed, who were not for the likes of me people until you actually talk to them. And some of those people, I would suggest, are one and the same. You know, that, that they're people who could be um, seduced into uh, uh, taking on uh, perhaps a, a more um, intense interest in, in arts and culture. And I think many of our students who are quite reluctant and are not for people like me type of people, and I teach quite a lot of those, uh, fall into that demographic. And now for something completely different, generation theory. <laughs> Another uh, um, bit of research by Howard Strauss, um, and uh, this has been completely overused, really, by uh, the marketing people uh, who feel they can classify certain generations. Um, and our student body are on the cusp of Generation Y and Generation Z. Um, and uh, it's interesting how their definitions chime with uh, those uh, analyses of those of the of the arts institutions and organisations, government and education. Next, so um, our students uh, they mostly fall on on the cusp of generations Y and Z, uh, born around 1994. Um, so uh, they are digital natives. Uh, they've. They've, they've never dialed a number on a phone. Um, and, uh, they, you know, cassette tape, they wouldn't know what to do with. Um, and uh, they see CDs as vintage ephemera. I really like that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they have a completely different way of engaging with the world than my generation. Completely different, you know, and it never ceases to amaze me. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I, this is a, I don't know if you can see the detail of that. That's my, that's, uh, my students, they're interior students. Um, uh, in the, uh, you might well recognise the building, it's the Guggenheim in New York. Um, there they are taking it in. Uh, they've taken all their selfies. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're just sitting down telling their friends what it is they're doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting um, how, uh, uh, how differently they experience things. Um, but, uh, you know, characteristics of uh, some of these uh, uh, Generation Z people, uh, they're very techno-savvy. Um, they... They don't accept things readily. They want to know why they've got to do this. What's this for? Um, and they want everything to be transparent. They're, uh, and they're, they're completely, they've, uh, they've caused a bit of a problem for the marketing people because they're very sceptical about marketing, old marketing techniques. And they see them as clunky and ridiculous. Um, they're, they're opinionated. Um, uh, we, <laughs> I love the, the quote, quote at the bottom. Um, those of us interacting with the millennials do not need to defend ourselves or mask our intentions. We simply need to smartly compete for their fleeting attention. Uh, and uh, I think that's, I, I feel that to be quite true. Well, yes, maybe. Uh, but maybe, us, it's, it's, maybe it's us that's becoming uh, unemployable in the, in the 21st century. Um, so, the, the summary of all that, uh, uh, the democratisation of higher education has led to us having a cohort of students that are really, really uh, varied in their experience, their attitudes, their motivation, their attention spans. Um, and uh, education theory would suggest that we do need a, a, a range of, of approaches for that, to deal with that. Um, and they are, they have their own uh, um, ways of engaging with culture. Um, and uh, they are expert in areas that we are not. Uh, and they are, if you like, just starting out with the kind of intellectual engagement that we would consider to be a cultural activity. But it's not that they're not doing it, they're just doing it at a, at a different level, at a vernacular level. And therefore, our job is to engage with that and move them on. Um, so, our current student cohort, Generation Z, Media savvy, questioning, transparency loving, low boredom threshold, social networkers. Next. I'm rubbish at this. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of the things that I have done visit, visit wise um, to try and engage with some of this. Uh, this is uh, first year interior students, um, and they uh, were asked to produce a campus architecture guide, um, which was a, a, a booklet or a website or both, um, uh, which uh, looked at all the uh, buildings on the campus, all the buildings that have some kind of architectural worth. Um, and uh, we did this last year. It's, uh, it's in the pipeline at the moment. It's with the copywriters. Uh, <coughs> but, they, but they did, this group, this is them being shown round um, at the beginning of the project. Uh, it was quite challenging. I did it with level four because I had other things to do with level five and couldn't spare such a big chunk of time to do it. Um, and uh, uh, I, I did wonder if they would be able to, but they did. They did. They stepped up to the plate um, and uh, they each wrote about two buildings and then I chose the, I chose, uh, the best and put them... Uh, into some kind of walking sequence. So I, it's, it's going to be published. Um, and uh, yes. Uh, this was a, another uh, type of visit. This was a joint project between um, CNCS and again Interior, um, and again Level 4, uh, from about uh, three years ago. Um, 
and uh, this was devised with a colleague, a studio tutor, uh, and it was a live project for Letchworth Garden City Heritage. Um, and they had to produce a sort of sensory walkway. Um, oh, oh dear. <laughs> Sorry. Still Is it still going? <laughs> Good. Um, and uh, yes, and, uh, and, I, and I was, she and I plotted uh, what the sort of things that they would learn from this activity. And I uh, came up with some links that I thought, you know, it, it, was a very, it was a very fertile ground, really, looking at the garden city, uh, the whole notion of the garden city and the, it, the architectural influences and the links with utopias and dystopias and all of that stuff. And I, I absolutely loved it. And so did the students. They really liked it too. Uh, and it was very interesting to see that um, the students uh, eventually, when they came to do their degree essays, an awful lot of them did things that could be traced back to that. They did stuff about um, utopias. They did stuff about um, planning, you know, city planning and that sort of thing. They did stuff about um, domestic uh, architecture, um, social uh, impacts on, uh, uh, the social impact of architecture, um, on uh, towns and so forth. Um, yeah, so next one, thank you. Uh, this was the this was the visit, uh, and uh, they uh, I I have a I have a camper van which you can see in the top left hand corner there. So that was a tutorial room, and um, oh the, there's the queue for tutorials, and there's a, a, a tutorial underway in the bottom right hand corner, uh, and. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, very successful. It was a very successful day. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and the students actually did get uh, a lot out of it. Um, and I think it was, they did learn on a lot of levels about a lot of things, uh, which was very useful. Yes, next one. Um, and these are just some of the just visual reminders of some of the things that I actually uh, made connections with the uh, arts and crafts movement, domestic architecture uh, through the ages, uh, the, the garden city uh, architecture, um, it, it, between the wars, um, domestic architecture, um, and then post-war modernism. You know, we've got the ride just up the road. You know, it's a great, uh, it's a great resource, really, uh, for the students to go and look at uh, modernism in action. Uh, and so, I, you, you know, that's... Uh, just uh, one of many connections was the sort of walk through domestic architecture through the ages, if you like. Um, and the, and uh, another type of visit that I do is um, we do with both product design and um, uh, interior, we do a, a, a competition that's run by the design museum called Design Factory, uh, which is, is very good. It requires the students to go to a, uh, an exhibition um, and then to design something uh, uh, which answers a brief, a very ge generic sort of brief, uh, which they set. Somebody from the Designs of the Year um, exhibition, uh, a shortlisted designer, uh, will set the brief. And we do it every year. We were a pilot university for the scheme. We've been doing it for years now. And every year we get students who are picked uh, the prize is to go to a symposium with the designer and they, uh, they have an experience of, uh, of being a real designer for a day. It's highly creative. Um, it's, uh, it's good. It's very good. Um, and uh, so I actually take the students to the exhibition um, and I do some of, the, some of the required work. I assess as a formative assessment. Uh, the studio staff also have a greater, depending on the year and the brief, a greater or lesser involvement in that. Okay. Um, and these are some of the students actually, this is, these are design factory visits, these two pictures. Um, and the, the benefits, the, what seem to be the obvious benefits to the students, they do find them enjoyable. Uh, and it's very easy to start where they are, to get them to look at something and analyse it in their own words, even if they haven't got the vocabulary as yet. Um, uh, and it, 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 
it means that the, the less academically minded, many of whom have never been to a museum, uh, um, start to feel comfortable in that kind of scenario and, and start to be able to compare and contrast, etc. Um, and they begin to also assemble some kind of a notion of the context in which they're designing because they, many of them have never seen anything, really. Not really. Seems remarkable, but they haven't. Um, and it's a perfect environment for encouraging critical insight and teaching them how to analyse. Um, and uh, that, uh, once they've done it once, they can go on their own and do it again. You know, and I, I, I'm very, I'm very school mumish. I give them a, a pres prescriptive set of tasks that they have to do, uh, but then they've got that kind of toolkit for whenever they go to a, a museum. Okay. I did a survey as well. Sorry, how am I doing for time? Am I going on forever here? No, you've got at least... All oh, right, that's fine. I'm nearly at the end. I'm nearly at the end now. Um, I did a survey to see what the students thought of the idea of visiting. And I, I interviewed interior uh, students. So I, gave, I didn't interview them. I gave them um, uh, an anonymous survey to fill in. Uh, and these students had been to a lot of different... Um, exhibitions and uh, sites. So a mixture of the sort of thing that we saw at Letchworth, you know, uh, where they were actually just visiting particular sites, local sites, housing developments. They'd done a lot of self-directed visits as well for me, where they'd chosen things. They'd been on trips abroad. Um, and uh, they'd also been to exhibitions at the Barbican, the V&A, the Design Museum, Royal Academy and others. Um, and uh, the assessment outcomes um, included all sorts of uh, all sorts of outcomes. Really, uh, I encourage them to sketch. And uh, I um, do. Uh, here's a couple of examples. These are hot off the press. This was uh, self-directed visits over the summer for level five products and interior. Um, and they chose where they went, um, and, uh, and they had to take a theme, one of the themes from um, the lectures that, that were, they were about to have this term. So that one is, uh, I think, the boundaries of art, craft, and design. That one is a sense of place. Um, and they chose where they went, uh, and the, the requirement was that they did some kind of a visual presentation which was full of their kind of uh, own insights um, uh, about uh, what they saw. So that's uh, an example of, of, of outcomes. Um, but also we do things that are to do with the whole process, really, uh, like mind maps, um, and uh, um, they do presentations, and also sometimes it's just it's the research for essays. Um, and uh, so the students filled in this um, survey. Could you put the next slide on, please? Sorry. Um, and the, the results were really positive. Uh, the students said things like, the quotes at the top there, of utmost importance to our progress. Really good to actually experience these spaces rather than just see pictures. Uh, about the self-directed visits, some students still found that a little bit forbidding. Um, but many, about <coughs> half the students actually really liked uh, them. Um, and uh, they like to be able to choose their own place to go that related to, to the assessment outcome. Um, and uh, they like to go at their own pace. Um, about a third of that group had never been, before they came here, never been to a museum or a gallery. And almost all of them, all except one in fact it was, felt their experience had changed their feelings about visit in a positive way. All the students said that the, the visits had helped them understand the broader cultural aspects of art and design. So, 
Um, uh, uh, my conclusions from this uh, is are uh, that uh, that we that I I shouldn't say we I'm not speaking for everybody else this is just what I do respect their initial efforts and responses you know start where they are encourage them uh, to express themselves about what they see and experience uh, give them a structured experience so that they understand what they need to do it isn't enough just to continue to go round and say well that's nice I like that um, you know, get, get, sort of entice them into the whole world of analysis. Um, and, uh, but, but to accept um, a certain amount of vernacular culture, you know, the legitimacy of, of their point of view and what they think is important and experience and some of the everyday informal networks um, that, uh, that they look at. I haven't, uh, I haven't investigated this area really much at all. Uh, but I suppose that's another quite fertile place to go. Uh, next. So uh, what, what uh, I feel uh, is the right way to go for me with the students and, and visits is, is, to, uh, is to basically lead them with incremental steps, really, um, through uh, familiarising themselves with, with um, cultural sites and, uh, and experiences. So they start close by, somewhere they know and feel comfortable with, um, with sort of uh, um, the kind of uh, uh, the sort of stuff you might look at with them, sort of uh, reviews and reports and, you know, press articles and that sort of thing. Uh, user trips, disassembly, and uh, you know, hands-on stuff, interactive stuff, um, and then uh, beginning to move into more um, uh, challenging analysis, if you like. Um, uh, but uh, the, I found all the students uh, are really interested in in semiotics and in semiotic analysis of what they see, um, and that's uh, quite encouraging. Um, uh, and uh, oh, I'm particularly interested, really, in social uh, history and, you know, social and cultural change and that sort of thing. So I suppose it's inevitable that they're also interested in that. Um, and then the unfamiliar context, you know, where they, they, where they might feel uncomfortable. I start with the, uh, you know, the, 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 poppy at the Tower, poppies at the Tower of London kind of scenario, you know, a, 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 a pop popular populist art and design. Uh, and people like uh, Banksy and Thomas Heatherwick and Jonathan Ive and uh, um, celebrity environments, you know, the Shard and Tate Modern and uh, um, Eden uh, and all those awful uh, hotels that they love in Dubai and places like that. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the, you know, the, the products that they really, really like, the brands they like, they're all brand mad, the product designers. Uh, and uh, popular higher culture, you know, looking at... Uh, at um, art and design movements that perhaps uh, have popular appeal. Um, and, and then it, it's quite easy then to move them into uh, a, a engaging with perhaps more challenging texts and tasks uh, when they feel confident. And uh, it's, been very, it's, been, it's been very interesting that the group that did the um, the campus architecture guide uh, this year they're level five and uh, you know I, I had some in that group there were some quite difficult lads who were uh, just not not wanting to engage at all at the beginning and they are at the forefront of discussions now they will talk quite readily um, uh, uh, you know, give them, give them a text to read, something to read, they, which they bring in, and they've done a bit of research on it, and they will talk about it. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're almost unrecognisable, really, from the students that started last year. And um, they just, uh, I don't know, they, just, they, they seem to take to it, uh, the idea of visiting places, and, and their, what their responses um, are valued about those places. So um, I think I am going to ca certainly going to carry on doing it. I think it needs a lot of refinement. It doesn't always work, obviously. Not everything's good. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think there's, 
there's mileage in it, I think. Next one. You must be near the end now. Um, yes. So um, I think uh, direct contact with artefacts and environments is a good thing. Um, and, they, uh, and they do remember that stuff, and therefore they, they default to it when they've got to choose to do something like a degree essay. You know, they, they will actually um, think about, they've been, it's been turning over in their heads, perhaps right through the course, and they will go back to it and, and, uh, and take some aspect, um, but in a much more advanced format, if you like. You know, they will take some aspect of it that's far more challenging. Um, and they feel comfortable. Uh, you know, we had, uh, had some, again, <laughs> students who were very unpromising at the beginning uh, who got, uh, took them to the V&A. I would take them to the V&A first. It's the first thing I do, do it in the first week of level four. Um, and uh, they, they, were very, they were very taken with Del Chihuly's uh, glass piece in the entrance hall. And, uh, and they, they went off looking for galleries they you know they did the old uh, the old digital thing that they always do they searched and they found and they they went off to various galleries and they were saying oh it was dead posh it was really posh and there was this really snotty woman but do you know what they had some great stuff in there look at this and uh, you know they got loads of photographs and and uh, i thought well that's great really because they they felt comfortable going into places that perhaps they would not have gone into before and, uh, and having experiences and it was you know it wasn't deep and meaningful but it was a start um, and uh, you know and I, I think many of them have no notion really of the the scope of the of cultural experiences that you can have you know I think it's new to many of the students and they do develop um, a reflective response over time um, and it won't be amazing but it will be enjoyable for them it's something it's a life skill isn't it really something you can enjoy for the rest of your life really